hello good evening and uh, uh, so today we will i'm i have a uh, you know pleasure in meeting you all for this talk so i'm going to talk on a slightly different topic uh, i'm kind of combining uh, some amount of psychology experience user experience and nlp um, and uh, that's what i've put together across uh, the objective i want to achieve with this is kind of develop a holistic thinking uh, from the perspective of uh, you know data science how data science can intermingle with multiple disciplines and uh, provide uh, uh, you know a solid product that not only kind of solves a problem but actually um, thinks about a holistic solution so anthropomorphism in conversational user interfaces that's the topic above we will start with a small uh, introduction to what is conversational user interfaces uh, this is your typical amazon uh, eco uh, your siri and uh, possibly some of the bots you would have interacted uh, on your phone or on websites etc so these come under the large classes of conversation user interfaces wherever you are able to uh, have a conversation with a machine comes under this gamut of conversation user interfaces um we'll just turn the pages of history and we we'll look at uh, where it all started uh, so it was just a fun game when it started it started with uh, turing tests and uh, eliza and things like that so for those of you who don't know what a turing test is this was well developed in 1950s where there was a, a person standing in front of the computer and um, there can be two responses from the machine either the machine kind of responds or uh, uh, to a query from the user or another human being could respond so wherever the uh, the user is not able to distinguish between a machine generated response to a user generated response it is supposed to have achieved some success so alan turing is the person behind this test and he kind of predicted by the year 2000s uh, the responses would be so uh, indistinguishable between human beings and uh, and machines so i don't know if machines have become uh, like human beings but there are certain conversations where when you talk to uh, chat assistants they do sound like machines so in one way or the other i think we have achieved what alan turing said to um, so coming back to general purpose so these are your general purpose conversation interfaces where you are simply able to chat maybe at the maximum you know ask about temperature weather etc or in case of uh, alexa and devices like that you are able to uh, you know play a song and do some very very simple tasks um, uh, but it is more for engagement more for developing you know a uh, user engagement with the user not so much about um, you know solving big problems right so but this is where it all started this curiosity to develop the connect between human beings and machines where you are able to have a nice chat with a machine right so that's that's where it all began and um, that is where even from 1950s to 2000s a hell lot of development on this area lot more uh, focused on natural language processing and uh, uh, you know uh, possibly using things like recurrent neural networks etc to have to hold a meaningful conversation um, uh, with uh, a human being right so you get those snappy responses from uh, siri or you know uh, or any other uh, interface like that it is more to have that fun conversation have a more engaging conversation with a human being from there things got uh, so this is an example of what is a general purpose uh, uh, machine do it says okay for example user says what's your name and then the clever bot whatever the name of the uh, bot is just trying to hold and stick on to a conversation right there's nothing else getting achieved they're just chatting this is having a casual chat with and if the idea being that hey if we can crack this casual chat then we could do far better things right but the far better things came into picture off late like maybe 6 years back or something similar to it also called as the enterprise bots what these are trying to achieve is to achieve a goal right achieve a task um possibly a complex task but it could be things like booking a flight or you know answering things like why my bill is high uh, it could cross sell it could uh, work with the user give different perspectives etc so that was the idea of this goal oriented uh, conversation interfaces um and 
possibly if worked well, if done with the right level of efficiency, we could save millions of dollars with these um, kind of bots, right? So it's it's out there. Uh, the previous one we saw, the general purpose one, it's more fun, more casual. This is more uh, formal. This is more enterprise driven. This has to be fairly more accurate. You can't have, um, even in the previous conversation we saw, right? So it's, it's just about name, what is your name, etc. Any response would look apt, right? But here the response is, if I ask what is my bill, I don't expect um, a snappy response to come uh, from there, right? They say that you should better know your bill or something like that. You don't expect that. You expect an actual bill amount and with a due date, etc. So things are more goal oriented, things are more focused and things have to be to the point and things also have to be sharp and more accurate. So, but what happened is, are we, are we in the right state, right? So, are these conversation interfaces uh, doing some, uh, something, are they addressing the right gap in the market, are, are they kind of out there and have people started adopting this in a big way? So, the answer lies in the chart here. So, if you look at, these are some of the responses that users gave when asked, will you use um, a bot for uh, helping yourself answer a query, right? And some of them said, um, you know, keeps me from a live person, there are too many unhelpful responses, etc. So there is a gap and we all know that in the market today. How much ever NLP in itself has advanced, we do see that there is a gap of adoption when it comes to bots and bot interfaces, right? So a lot of, lot of customers, um, you know, have um, have a problem interacting with the bot and why is that so? Because they, they lose some touch, they lose some connect that they would otherwise, um, you know, get from a human assistant. Today, uh, you have a problem, you would rush to a call or you would, you would uh, lo love to talk to a human agent because you are intuitively, you think that, hey, machine may not be able to answer that, uh, answer the question uh, in the right point of time, whereas a human will understand and human will be able to connect to my problem better. And that possibly is the next area of advancement we are going to see in this, right? So it's very essential, like we saw um, uh, in goal-oriented uh, uh, conversation interfaces or goal-oriented bots, it's very, very necessary that the machine stays connected with the user, but not only that, it has to go and really solve the problem for the user, for which a trust has to be developed, for which a connect has to be made, even in if it is a two to three minute of conversation, even if it is a, uh, you know, less than a minute and a half kind of conversation, it's very important to establish the trust between the machine and the human being, right? And hence, we are going to talk about um, a new way of kind of thinking about um, uh, the conversation interfaces and we, um, uh, and, and the answer could possibly lie here. So we have done enough and more with NLP, enough, at least um, in English language, there is a lot of advancement out here, um, you know, given a fairly good amount of data, uh, models can be trained and uh, you, you could have the state of the art NLP engine, but is that alone sufficient to carry out an adoption? To, uh, with the users, is that alone sufficient to have a conversation? The answer is probably no and which is why we saw the previous slide, what people are thinking about, what is missing in current conversations, right? So the answer could lie in consumer psychology or the answer could lie in user experience. So we are going to talk about an area where over and above NLP, what can happen to make, to have meaningful conversations with machines? So. Uh, this is called anthropomorphism. Uh, this is nothing new. It's an age-old thing. It's a most is the more intuitive thing for human beings to connect with inanimate objects. So it could be uh, inanimate or non-human beings, right? So it could be even your dog, cat, or it could be um, a chair, for example, or it could be uh, you know the projector here, for example. Anything inanimate, anything non-human, um, you know, how do you connect with them? So one big technique we have figured over millions of years that is called anthropomorphism. You are trying to create a human-like character to a non-human object. So we, know, we all know the story of Panchatantra. It was where a minister wanted to teach few young kids, uh, the few princes of the way of life. And what is the best mechanism he sought out? He sought out to take all the animals, give it some human characters, make them speak, tell them what they wish in order to make these princes understand 
uh, you know the concept of life and understand the preaching, understand the ways of life, right? You could also see that very distinctly done uh, from a child, right? So uh, those of you who observe children close enough would know that they are always doing something on their own. They are never bored to be alone. Uh, so they could take these Barbie dolls or take some uh, toys or cars or whatever and then they can play on their own. So what are they doing? They are creating a world on their own. It's uh, popularly called the pretend play but fundamentally they are trying to create uh, human beings out of the dolls and the toys and things that they see and then they create this imaginary world and can stay connected to this. This is a simple concept of anthropomorphism and now the question is where have we used it? So where all have we seen um, uh, you know anthropomorphism being used right? For example um, you look at the early ships uh, and people when they used to refer ships they used to call it she and engines were you know referred as if they were uh, living human beings and uh, same with the uh, same in, uh, same is the case with car so uh, people who are very attached to car do tend to call them with a human reference but from there on we move to um, the core technology um, that we use uh, our computer so the one that you are seeing on the screen um, this this one the one that says hello uh, for example that is the 1984 Mac the first version of Macintosh so when uh, Steve Jobs uh, saw all the IBM uh, uh, you know computers out there then they were all command line interfaces uh, you know it was more people who know a lot of programming and who, who can only operate machines and they had those kind of interfaces it literally made people uh, uh, you know the bulk of users stay away from the computer so guess what he did he, he did um, a simple graphical user interface and it could start communicating in more human like language than the previous computers have uh, communicated right so for example um, IBM uh, 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 when Macintosh was coming out the 1984 uh, Macintosh was coming out this, uh, the famous advertisement that Steve Jobs ran it had all people you know looking out as uh, uh, you know machines and then how um, a normal human being could change the whole thing right so he wanted um, uh, this uh, 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 this Macintosh to be like one among the rest of the people and hence he got this concept of um, a user interface which is more uh, you know user friendly and human uh, had a human character to it rather than just looking at it as a machine the other one all of us are familiar with these are some of this is how Firefox for example tried to th change our way into thinking about error messages right till then you got your broken link messages or error 404 or some goddamn number there which you couldn't relate to but then they made this more fun and hence more interactive right so that's the concept that if applied for example on conversation user interfaces can things change can adoption increase can success rate of any of these bots uh, you know do better so this is the underlying theory of anthropomorphism this theory gets a little bit into psychology uh, so why do people have the fundamental necessity to connect to objects which are non-human beings through as if they are human beings right so what is the fundamental necessity why have uh, they done this for a long period of time right and, and as we saw this is a very uh, intuitive thing for a child to do this is how we have been having our religion gods and things like that like we want to put a human character to understand that object better so what is that underlying theory that is making this happen um, it's a three factor theory that got proposed um, it has three arms in it one is elicited agent knowledge effectance motivation and sociality motivation these are your ticking points or this is what triggers um, a human being to connect to an inanimate object for example elicited agent knowledge is if I for example think this chair is a human being right so I would understand possibly um, you know how it feels when somebody pushes it or how it uh, you know feels when we sit on it or how if it gets kicked out what it could possibly do so it kind of gives us some understanding of the attributes at play on an inanimate object so for example um, the pet lovers do this right so uh, when you have a dog you kind of treat uh, the dog like a child like a human child and hence you know how the dog feels right and you can understand the dog better right so that's the fundamental uh, need or necessity that is driving um, you know for uh, a human being to connect to an inanimate object 
once that connection is established right once you understand what are what is happening um, you know what is the knowledge of these inanimate things because you are now thinking this to be a human being you can have an effectance motivation which is nothing but you could interact better suppose i understand how this inanimate object would behave now i uh, understand what are things that is going on in i would be able to interact better if i have um, the human attributes put on it the third thing is sociality motivation so uh, this is fundamentally because people feel lonely and hence they want to connect um, there are no other human beings to connect they are connecting with a machine so sociality motivation fundamentally a lot of initial interactions of siri Uh, initial interactions of any of those uh, fun bots so called fun bots in fact interestingly eliza when it was developed uh, initially it was more to more as a therapist kind of thing where you can have a therapeutic conversation um, as if you have it with a psychologist and then the eliza will kind of try to respond so that is kind of driven by that factor of sociality motivation that you want to connect with human beings around you and instead of that you are kind of replacing that with some other object so then there are kinds of anthrop anthropomorphism one is a structural anthropomorphic form gestural and then character and then a higher form right so in structural anthropomorphic form is the obvious example is your robots right the humanoid robots the reason why they look like a robot for example um, is that you can connect with them better so structurally they represent something the same thing happens with um, you know uh, you hear a female voice for example that is a structural anthropomorphic so that's what ticks that there is a lady talking to you so interestingly um, i was part of an initial bot deployment for one of the startups and we named this bot as maya so and uh, it is talking to the indian audience so and the bot very clearly declares that uh, hey i am maya i am a virtual assistant and i am here to help you and a lot of feedback that we read um, you know after the interaction is hey can i talk to maya can i get maya's phone number etc so the the voice and the name in this case started and i am telling you a real example right you may think people are dumb and then why are they not understanding but it did happen there were live um, messages that we got which said uh, you know uh, can we have phone number of maya so the structural anthropomorphic uh, stuff plays on your head so when you see sir, when you see a machine uh, you know in the form of a, a human being or when you even hear things like a voice as a female voice or uh, you know or a male voice in different cases but you have a human voice out there you have a certain connection already made right so and hence the conversation goes on to the next level you don't have the initial engagement problem that you have in some of these cases gestural anthropomorphic things are when uh, 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 you know this is this is where the machine can understand a gesture but also the machine starts to talk to you in gestures as if you are talking to a human being one is your robots etc but even things like if you remember your vibration in the phone right the the symbol it gives it gives you a head shake hand shake head shake right it is as if it's giving you a gesture of whether it has and it is kind of telling you that um, you know uh, i i am going to vibrate or this is vibrating etc as if the head is shaking even those kind of things are non verbal cues and visual cues that kind of play on our head to connect to a machine better um anthropomorphic form of character are your persona so this is your this a lot of people have tried in the past these are your avatars right so the machine kind of takes an avatar or the bot takes an avatar which which avatar to connect to whom etc so that that also um is more about character it could also interestingly um there was a blog article by uh, one of the person behind the cortana right so uh, microsoft uh, Uh, uh bot uh, and how she kind of uh, defined a personality uh, to the bot and how how do people normally go about defining a personality right so um there is a persona that the bot exhibits it is not so much in structure um it is not so much about uh, gesture or whether it understands it but the way it conveys about the bot itself so for example if you if you take siri siri is very snappy right it kind of throws things out to you it is very bold it's out on the face now these were thought through when siri was developed and hence um, and and uh, there is a whole um, uh, you know uh, the whole uh, domain on user experience which is kind of sitting and uh, developing these personas 
thinking very actively about what that persona that uh, bot should have. So every bot, for example, has that uh, persona and that kind of connects. And it, it stands out more than your structure and gesture. Aware anthropomorphic form of thought, this is absolutely even more the next level, right? So can it even do better than uh, a human being? Can it kind of help uh, on extraordinary things? That is uh, aware anthropo anthropomorphic form. And this is about thought and how can, how can you exhibit um, the anthropomorphic characteristics of a bot with, with respect to thought, etc. And again, this is not only for bots. I've just uh, applied it to bots and told you. But any anthropomorphism, uh, if you're developing any product, all of these can uh, come in handy. So we will now apply to our original problem, which we said that, hey, we know conversation user interfaces. They are there now for 70 years almost uh, in the shape and form kind of we see. But, uh, but then uh, over the last 5, 10 years, it kind of got applied to solving more serious tasks, um, having a much more goal-oriented and a much more directed uh, problems at hand. But how can anthropomorphism, which we could associate with, again, we talked about Siri, we talked about some of these things, but then how can, but that's just not fun, right? But that is actually connecting you to the machine. Now, how can this be applied when you are possibly, um, you know, looking at a conversation user interface, which is going to solve uh, uh, you know, which is going to solve a particular problem. So the problem can be as mundane as booking a reservation on for a, in a hotel, or you know, it could be as mundane as asking, um, I'm not uh, happy with my bill, or even how to make my payment. These connects are very, very important because at the end of the day, remember you are trying to have a conversation, right? And and when you have a conversation, it's very important that you have a connect with whomever you have the conversation. So these traits, however subtle they may be, however uh, embedded they may be, kind of helps to have these conversations better and kind of helps in solving the problem is set out to solve. So what is the fundamental problem? Um, you know, a, a voice bot or a chat bot or any other user interface on conversation trying to solve, it is trying to possibly replace an equivalent human assistant. So we, these are all dollar values, right? So we, if, you, if you replace an entire call center of, let's say, 400, 500 people with, uh, you, uh, with uh, worthy um, CIs, then you have so much money saved. And hence, though these conversations are very serious, um, they are not like the ones that we talked about earlier, but it is very, very important for the user to stay connected to the machine at hand. So, so I have kind of tried, there is no, per se, this is a very nascent area. There is not a theoretical model or something on the research which explains how can we make a goal-oriented system um, you know, more anthropomorphic. There is nothing out there. This is my initial, um, you know, thoughts on how would I break a goal-oriented system uh, so that it sounds more anthropomorphic, uh, it sounds more like human, it sounds simple so that human beings can connect to it. So, uh, turns, in, we'll talk about each of these in detail. One is a turns in a conversation, understanding emotions, um, providing fillers and pauses, and personalizing with, with user personas. But what is going to happen is, at each of these, the decision that the bot is also making is, hey, am I going to handle this question sometimes, or am I not going to handle this, I'm just going to let somebody else take the question. Sometimes it's very frustrating to work um, with a bot where you are keeping asking the same question and it is answering the same answer, and then you are going in loop, right? So when to stop and when to handle is something that the bot will have to decide. And these anthropomorphic traits could explain that better. Uh, and uh, and how to handle also sometimes the way it's way a bot speaks um, you know or the way a bot types it could kind of help you get that anxiety down help you on a level plane and hence more open to a conversation so what is a turn in a conversation um, so for example this is a small conversation Myra and customer is having the conversation so you see the person wants to, the Myra clearly declares I'm an AI assistant. And then she says that table, I want to book a table for two. And then down in the conversation, the customer, like with any other human being, which says, okay, you know what, I don't want to have the dinner today, but I want to have a lunch tomorrow, right? Now, this is one point of failure with a lot of uh, um, customer-facing uh, uh, bots today, where they completely lose track 
they never expected when somebody asked for a cuisine preference, the customer said, you know what, I'll have dinner tomorrow, so uh, lunch tomorrow, right? Uh, that's a very common thing with a human assistant, but a bot is not used to it. But if the bot can figure out this, right? If this turn in the conversation, if it can handle naturally, first thing for that, it has to understand a turn, and then it has to also handle it very naturally, like a, how a human being would have handled, then people possibly could connect more. So how do you identify turns, right? One is you could have dialogue states in your systems where uh, in uh, so dialogue slates or st slot machine kind of in uh, kind of architecture where you have a bunch of attributes um, in the slot machine and then you are kind of constantly tracking what are these attributes in each of these slot machines and then when one attribute is there or not there you kind of you are able to reset some of these things and start recapturing this this is one way another is what happens in some of these bots is at every time a user types an, a response, there is a classifier or there is an ML model that's running at the back end. Now, if the ML model could also be simply tuned to identify turns as much as you know other topics that it is trying to identify, possibly a turn handling mechanism could be built on top of it once the natural language processing identifies, look, there is no answer here, but it is actually a reset kind of a response where I will hold some of this information and I will destroy some of the information, right? And hence, um, you know, the conversation can be set back into mode. And uh, there is, if those of you who want to get a little deeper into this topic, there is something called as a dialogue track uh, state challenge. Uh, it is a DTSC challenges. There are three or four challenges out there. Um, and uh, they have given a huge corpus of data. Um, some of these corpus of data are created uh, by Mechanical Turks or um, um, Mechanical Turks using a Wizard of Oz fashion. Basically, there are two human beings talking, but they don't know that they are talking to human beings. Right? And hence, there is a lot of variation that comes in these conversations. And uh, the challenge here is, can you take these conversations and if you mechanize these conversations, now will the machine be intelligent enough to understand and maintain the smooth flow that we are, uh, you know, the human being was able to maintain with the user. Right? So uh, for those of you interested, you guys can just look at the DTSC challenges and participate and possibly there could be more ideas out here. And this, uh, the third ex the third is very simple. Look for you know turns in natural language, which is you know your instead and but and things like that. Uh, however, and things like that, where you know you're hearing for those markers, and then you kind of change your dialogue flow based on that. Now, how to handle right? So one way is uh, yeah, you start all over again. Um, and then sometimes it so happens that the human being at uh, the uh, bot is understanding all correct, right? The natural language is very good, the NLP is working perfectly, the intelligent agent is really intelligent and understood everything, but then there is no flow to exit, right? It's kind of asking the question, person is also changing things. Uh, you know, on and off, then possibly, you know, may not be the right user to handle, maybe you kind of silently move out of the conversation and then, uh, uh, you know, maybe that query gets handled by some other human being or it gets handled in some other way. And uh, uh, yeah, so that's the, that's, that's when to stop handle and then uh, before stop handling, kind of try and see if there is any other way to handle this, maybe give a widget or something like that so the human being can play on and off, uh, setting up different parameters, etc. There is another uh, interesting research paper I saw on this, that when they kind of, especially with uh, changing requirements, let's say I'm, I want to buy a washing machine, or I want to buy a fridge, I have not made up my mind, right? I'm saying this specification, that, etc. And you don't also want to put a human assistant there because he's going to waste a lot of time. Uh, and a bot kind of cannot handle beyond a particular point of um, you know, input. So in the research paper, they have uh, suggested an interface uh, that will keep popping what the bot, bot has understood. And so the user can go free and change if the understanding has not been correct. Understanding and handling emotions, this is the classic sentiment analysis, but this sentiment kind of works at every line uh, that the user types. And then, it, and then uh, you know, you know how to handle this and you kind of also understand instead of a classic sentiment analysis where you know it's a positive or negative, you also kind of track the intensity kind of a heat map. But when, when the intensity kind of breaks after a certain point, then maybe the bot can say now I'm done with it. So this person is really irate and he re requires someone else better to handle. 
Uh, tonality in voice, um, another research area, like how do you figure out whether somebody is angry or somebody is sad? Um, or, you know, with respect to the use case that we have at hand, which is more goal-oriented goal uh, tasks, nobody is going to be sad, but people are going to be either irate or they are going to be neutral. There can be only two states there. So you're kind of trying to figure out um, the, uh, the pitch and the, uh, and the timber in the voice, uh, and then kind of uh, possibly take the text uh, of what you said and then based on that say that okay this is positive or negative uh, or you can kind of the classic approach take a classifier trained on different emotions there are data sets out there for um, having your um, uh, you know classifier based on some of these data sets uh, uh, you know using CNN or something like that these can be trained and given a voice uh, clip it can say whether somebody is uh, sad or somebody is emotional or non-emotional or somebody is angry or somebody is happy right and use of emoticons uh, another uh, way to how to handle some of these things right so you get a very irate customer and let's say it's a text-based conversation interface the <coughs> uh, the bot could also cool down the user with a little bit of emoticons um, it could throw in a lot of empathetic statements uh, like how uh, normally they try to calm you down so it could also play that role of kind of understand that hey there is a problem and I totally acknowledge it now what can we do about it um, uh, or in case of when it is really negative and uh, the bot thinks it's not ready uh, it cannot handle it you just transfer that out so uh, uh, providing fillers pauses and also chronomics chronomics is uh, the time that it takes uh, for anything to respond so time also play the response time also is in the mental makeup of uh, how human beings view a conversation right so it's not about um, you know whether something is understood and some response is got but what time it takes to get not too fast not too slow is the right way to go by go about it because let's say I'm asking why is my bill high for example and the bot rattles out a bunch of possible reasons and you don't even have you know the cognition to read each of that so that's too fast so playing on the chronomics of uh, how something is uh, state what is the speed of stating something making it too slow would also uh, uh, you know make the user wait but making it too fast also has its disadvantages and then fillers and pauses are like um, if you remember um, uh, uh, you know the Google okay Google's demo that came out last year where the voice assistant is trying to book a, a hair salon appointment for its client it says mm -hmm, in between right so it kind of gives so the other person literally doesn't know that they're talking to a bot in that case it doesn't even make a if you uh, relook at the video it doesn't even kind of give any disclaimer I'm a voice assistant or something like that just gets into the job directly and uh, uh, those pauses and fillers when especially the other person is talking to you know kind of helps uh, when you give those pauses and fillers um, uh, uh, you know better uh, it kind of gives that framework of mind that yeah you are talking to somebody more relatable so uh, this is personalizing bot persona with the user persona uh, so you could meaning for want of bit there are a lot of personas out there um, you know personas itself is uh, uh, you know it's a huge topic how do you extract personas user personas you have a lot of text data from there you kind of extract what kind of users is each persona but not only that try to match each persona of the user with possibly a personalized persona of your bot one uh, recommendation is just go with one persona of your bot so that people know whom you are interacting with rather than kind of having these uh, personalized personas but the other uh, end of the spectrum things that we should have um, you know one persona for one user right very personalized to my experience to how I converse to how I process things and how I understand things so for example we could have um, a non-tech persona which is fundamentally um, uh, you know somebody who is who's, who's like completely seeking the help of an assistant here to help the task for that person so they have to be literally hand guided through various steps so that is how the bot should work for that person 
um, somebody is like more of top management kind of thing, hey, get it done, I don't have time to go through all your steps. Can this be done? Possibly it's not even if the customer is worthy enough, um, if the customer is possibly a platinum customer or et cetera. Maybe, um, you know, handle that very differently. Possibly this is not even a profile that has to be handled by a bot. You could uh, possibly have uh, human assistants talking to this user, et cetera. The third is uh, the tech crowd. Possibly they mo they would want a more hands off kind of thing. Uh, it is more like hey, tell me where the information is rest. I will figure out that kind of crowd. Uh, you know, in the in in that cases, um, the interface has to the bot uh, kind of talks to them in that fashion, right? Just shows off things and then takes their hands out of it. So this is also kind of proven to be very successful. Um, uh, you know, it was some small experiments we carried out and then we figured out that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, matching the persona of the user with the persona of uh, developing a persona for the bot on the fly does also help. Right. So, uh, with that uh, kind of end of the conversation, uh, end of the uh, uh, topic, uh, the point I'm trying to bring home with this is, um, some of them is science, uh, some of them is hardcore uh, NLP and hardcore data science, but we also need to understand that these are things that is there for a reason, that they exist for a reason, right? The whole field of NLP, um, at least the momentum for the field of the NLP had, had come because people wanted to interact with computers very naturally, right? And, and that's very important. So it's not only important to understand what the user says, do your NERs, do your sentiments, etc., but it's also important to kind of lay them out on a canvas and understand here at the end of the day, this is about a user interaction. So how much more, um, you know, you make this look like a human conversation, so much more it is going to um, uh, you know, develop. So from the area of just doing uh, core NLP tasks to also trying to apply NLP, but to the area of, uh, you know, psychology and how human beings understand conversation, I believe could take, uh, uh, you know, conversation interfaces to the next level that that could drive millions of dollars to organization. So that's the thought I want to leave, uh, leave you behind with.